don't you wish your parents could be some point in your life like tonight? I remember my father and mother just two blocks in that direction signing my grade card every six weeks at University High School going, oh my God, <laughs> will he be something other than a garbage collector for the town of Normal? What a pleasure to be in person, first of all. Uh, practicing this in front of the bathroom mirror for the last three days, I've tried to get myself warmed up for an audience. Uh, the topic is one that's uh, near and dear, and I think that you will find uh, topics of interest as we proceed in this discussion. I would encourage, if, if we are going along the way, it takes me a while to get warmed up, if we go along the way, if you have a question that's sparked by something I've said or uh, a slide, please raise your hand and we'll try to address them in a timely way going forward. The moment one of the questions appears to be some similar to one of my dissertation defense questions, there are no more questions. <laughs> uh, the topic is enormous, and what I've tried to do is to assemble it in really three parts. Uh, one, I want to talk just a moment about uh, oral traditions and native people in particular, and the information that has been passed down over hundreds of thousands of generations about the relationship between people and the world around them. From there, I want to move on to uh, an interesting discipline, uh, ethnobotany, in which uh, interviews of native people have been conducted by botanists and biologists to try to capture this traditional knowledge about the relationship between people and plants and how plants were used for myriad purposes, and I think you'll be surprised to discover um, not only the number of plants that Native people have been familiar with over generations, but the variety of applications that these plants are uh, used to address a variety of different issues in life. And then I want to go to another sort of hybridized look at the world, which would be archaeobotany. And I want to give you a notion about how archaeologists have recovered plant remains from distant times and have analyzed them to get an understanding about how the relationship between humanity and plants has changed over time and how it's contributed profoundly to who we are today. Uh, this is a story that occurs not only in North America with indigenous people, but in every corner of the world. Uh, the notion of cultivation has revolutionized human life. And I think uh, I'll be able to describe that and its impact and, and why that relationship has been so important. I'd like to begin with an interesting note. Jacques Cartier, one of the French explorers of Canada and North America, finds himself in the winter of 1535-36, uh, uh, three ships mired down in the, in the Canadian winter and a recognition that many of the people on his crew are suffering from scurvy. Uh, and they're dying, and there is no known way to deal with this problem. But it turns out that Cartier is familiar with an Iroquois leader in the area who suggests to Cartier that he will go back to his community, engage the work of women within the community who take uh, pine, uh, juice, boil it, apply it as a poultice to the uh, wounds that are caused by scurvy. And as Cartier noticed at the end, all of those so treated rapidly recovered their health. So here you have these fellows who have traveled across the Atlantic Ocean in a wooden sailing ship, arrived here only to find themselves in great distress. And I suspect much to their surprise, that the indigenous people of the area have a cure for what ails the Frenchman. This underscores the fact that people who live on the land are deeply and intimately familiar with the way the world works. This is something, of course, all of us are concerned about is how the world works. But when you are literally living on the ground, uh, knowing how the world works is a matter of life and death on a daily basis. And so there's an accumulation of this knowledge, which then is transferred generation to generation to generation 
and has made its way into the future. This is the way I'd like you to, to begin to think about this. Um, one of the things as an undergraduate that I found interesting, I, I bumped into a professor who made the argument that most of the great discoveries in the world occur when two disciplines bump up to one another. And it's the relationship between those disciplines, the intersections of them, that give us perspectives about how the world works that maybe we hadn't thought very much about. So what I've tried to do here is in the upper right-hand corner, there's a sphere up there of anthropology, uh, the study of human beings, of culture, uh, the physical changes in humanity, as well as the cultural way we as human beings deal with the world. On the left-hand side, that orbit is botany, the study of plants. It has wide-ranging implications from uh, systemics of understanding the relationships of different species, genus, families, and, and so on, down to uh, work today, which looks at genetic properties of plants and so on. And then this, this lower realm, which uh, I've identified as indigenous cultures and their oral traditions. What we're going to do is explore this relationship, and in, in particular the intersections, beginning with oral traditions, moving in then to ethnobotany on the left-hand side, and then up into archaeobotany. Uh, so we'll take three different looks at uh, our understanding and knowledge of plants. Uh, you know oral traditions. They are, on the one hand, magical, and on the other hand, complicated. Uh, we know for practical examples, if I started over in this side of the room this evening and said something, by the time it got to the other side, it probably doesn't sound quite the same, which makes it even more astonishing and remarkable that the understanding of different aspects of the world around people have been recorded and passed on for generations upon generations upon generations about the way certain things work what certain plants can be used for. And this is serious business, is it not? Because some plants can be fatal. Some plants can be applied in different ways as uh, medicinal purposes or used for uh, the construction of implements or clothing. There is this incredible repertoire. And as we look more deeply into this tonight, when we get into botany, what we'll discover is that different groups of people saw different plants being applied in different ways. So it's not just a plant is good for this. Depending on where you are and what you're doing, a plant may be good for this under these circumstances or applied for that under other circumstances. And we know because we have some records of this, of contemporary records of photographs, of, of narratives, of people even yet still today who bear this long tradition and are able to articulate it and relate to us the fact that for thousands of years, people have seen the world in a particular way and that they are able to share that with us as an understanding. And we, we know we still continue to explore in different corners of the world to try to discover plants that have different properties, different capacities, different characterizations, different applicability. We have not overlook the fact that there are many people alive today who carry the tradition of generations prior to them that have some understanding. And I think you're going to be surprised the complexity and diversity of this, let alone the sheer number of plants that are understood by some groups of people to have particular properties that can be applied in a specific way. So the foundation of much of what we know about this even materials that we gather in the archaeological record are embodied in the knowledge of human beings who have kept track of this over time in every corner of the world, not only the indigenous habitants of North America, but in literally every corner of the world. This kind of information has been accumulated and passed on generation to generation with accuracy, with understanding of its values. When we look at ethnobotany, the relationship here is that as scientists, botanists, uh, spread out into the world with an academic perspective, one of the great desires was to learn from indigenous people in every corner of the world and to document 
in the way that we tend to document things, to write it down, to take pictures, make drawings, and try to understand, organize the world in a, in a particular way that we could articulate this understanding and information. And so when we look at bot ethnobotany, uh, these are people looking at particular cultures and documenting their behavior. What, what are they doing, under what circumstances, and so on. Ethnobotany has some interesting roots in North America. Here's a fellow, Sir Hans Sloan. Uh, Sloan happens to have been a member of the court in England. And you'll notice uh, 1660, 1753, a time of exploration in particular where North America is concerned, uh, European countries making their way into North America, encountering uh, the indigenous inhabitants of these continents from the tip of South America to the Arctic Circle in North America. Uh, Sloan is a physician, and you'll notice one of the reasons he's traveling here is he's looking for medicines. Already, uh, explorers have come back with information about how the inhabitants of North America deal with their world and deal with their lives. And Sloan is one of a great many people who come to North America looking for plants, not only uh, plant species to take back that may have some economic value, uh, medicinal value, but there are all sorts of foodstuffs, which of course are domesticated in the Americas to begin with by the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas. And these are being taken back and become staples in uh, European cuisine, uh, true or false. Tomatoes were uh, domesticated in Italy is false. Where were they domesticated? In the Americas, South America. Uh, potatoes, beans, maize, of course. A variety of plants which are well known to the inhabitants of the Americas end up being transferred back into European society and employed in a variety of manners to the point now that many recognize them. Well, the, the, the great tomato sauces of the world uh, surely don't have a taproot in South America, but in fact, they obviously do. I might note just in passing, this is an incredible time. Uh, Sloan himself uh, is one of, the, one of the, the foundations of museum building. He amasses an incredible collection. So large is his collection that he buys the home next to him in London and fills it. He invites literary people from London to visit him and thus is born the notion about curiosity, uh, cabinets of curiosity. And so after dinner, people sit down, they go to the cabinet, they pull an object out and begin to tell a story about it. The forerunner of, of exhibits. Sloan dies with uh, a collection of hundreds of thousands of objects and his family doesn't have a clue. What do we do with all of this? They convince parliament to accept the collection including plant specimens that he's gotten in the Caribbean. And this is the foundation of the British Museum of Natural History. This story is told multiple times around the world of materials that have been gathered and collected and brought back and served then as educational materials for a much broader audience. The understanding in detail of some of the indigenous societies of North America begin with people like Kieran Smith, uh, raised in Northwestern Indiana uh, with an interest in Native American botany. He ends up uh, living among tribes in Wisconsin, uh, the Menominee, for example. And he spends a fair amount of his time literally interviewing people. They're gracious enough to uh, encourage him to be part of the community, to sit down and relate to him uh, notions about the ability to identify certain classes of plants and to understand functionally how they work, what they use them for, and so on. And Smith begins to write a series of monographs here, uh, one published by the Public Museum of Milwaukee, The Ethnobotany of the, of the Ojibwe Indians. This would be one of a great many of academic treatises that are written on this topic that begin to accumulate at a time frankly, when there are challenges in Native communities that they are beset by the difficulty of sustaining life. Uh, we 
In, in anthropology, the late part of the 19th century is one seen by academics as of considerable alarm. And the alarm is by our own doing, that we have come to North America and South America. We have impacted the indigenous inhabitants here. We have displaced them from their land. We brought a series of diseases that we had well adapted to in Europe, which native people in North America were not adapted to. And the story is one, it's a tragic story of loss of life, of loss of land, and a great concern about loss of knowledge, because this knowledge is something recognized early on, is terribly important. And so these monographs that are written by people like Smith and others, gathering information about uh, the ethnobotany of the tribes in the Great Lakes region in the Southwest become uh, profoundly important to building a foundation that translates oral traditions into written documents for even greater numbers of people to begin to learn from. When you look at lists of them, and I've just grabbed a bunch here because my notion is that some of you are going to, well, I hope you leave this presentation and say, I want to know more about that. And I will tell you, there's a great body of literature that you're going to be able to get your hands on. Uh, all of these, you can see uh, Smith writes a lot of the Menominee, the Meskwaki, the Ojibwe, the Forest Potawatomi. Uh, tragically, Smith loses his life uh, early in life, or he would have made much uh, lengthier, greater contributions to this, but he's not alone. You can see other authors who are spending times with tribes uh, documenting plant use. One of the things that strikes you when you get into that literature and begin to look at it carefully is, is quantity. So here is a plant use database, an ethnobotanical plant use database, which the University of Kansas has assembled. Effectively, uh, researchers at the University of Kansas have gone to all of these ethnobotany reports. They've tried to gather that information together, assemble it in some sort of database architecture, and then make it available to the public to, to look at. And one of the things they uh, have provided for us uh, to illustrate uh, some of the quantity and quality of this information is a chart like this. So you can see on the uh, vertical axis, we go from zero to about 800. On the horizontal axis, we have medicines and food, animal medicine, animal food, fiber, dye, toys, and other. And you'll notice that medicine far almost doubles the, the applications for other purposes that, of, of plant use, which I think is noteworthy in itself. In, in fact, uh, to digress a moment, it's, it's, uh, is it not extraordinary? If I walked into the room tonight with a tray of plants and I said, I want each one of you to pick one and eat it, are there any volunteers? Or are you a little bit concerned about this? So imagine the, the strategy that's employed here of understanding that a particular plant is good to settle your stomach. There's an immense amount of science that is going on in these communities to draw conclusions about the efficacy and applicability of plants. Foods, of course, uh, little surprise here from uh, hunter-gathering strategies that recognize uh, the waxing and waning of productivity, uh, when nut masks are going to occur, the trees that produced last year that may not produce the next year, and so on. There is an in tuneness that occurs by people who live on the land. Uh, the other applications are not surprising. Uh, there are all sorts of things that plants are being used. So these databases that have harvested, if you will, information about plant use and make them available to us, give us an idea about how rich and the multiplicity of uses that we can learn from ethnobotanical study. Uh, this is a book that the, the museum published in the 1980s. Um, Fran King was a botanist at the Illinois State Museum. Uh, one of the things that archaeologists do when you uh, find an ancient site, the artifacts on the surface of a cornfield outside of normal, and you're trying to make sense out of it. And one of the things we would do would be to try to figure out what the environment looked like when people lived there. And when we would find plant materials within 
those occupations, try to interpret what they would mean. And one of the great things about interdisciplinary study, that is to say, when you bring together people with different expertise to view information and apply it to an understanding, is that you can sit at the knee of a, of a botanist who can say, well, you know, if you're finding this and that, there's some seasonal data there. If you're looking at this plant, and it may be rare and peculiar within the assemblage, well, it may have something to do with this. And Fran decided, you know what, I'm tired of the archeologist coming to my door and knocking on it and saying, hey, we found these plants. So she decided to write a book, which she published and handed to us and said, call me if there's an important problem. So this book uh, looks, and I picked on her description of pine in white pine in particular, because this is Cartier's problem. And so the Iroquois are aware of, of treating white pine sap in a particular way. And you'll notice that the inner bark is used for poultices and chest pain by the Benominee. Pitch is used as a salve by the Potawatomi, or it's used as a revival or inhalant by the Ojibwe. So here you have a one particular plant, one element of a particular plant that's being applied in a variety of ways that ethnobotanical data is gathered together in, in a book like Fran provides and gives us insight in the diversity of these applications. What makes it all the more interesting is in the back, and you'll not be able to read those, but the, basically this is a list of, of uh, plants found in Illinois. And you'll note the statistics that uh, Fran provides for us. There are 1,916 native plants that have been documented in Illinois. What is amazing to me is that a quarter of those have references in ethnobotanical literature as having some applicability by native people, be they medicines, be they construction materials, be they fibers to use for manufacturing of apparel, and so on and so forth. So this demonstrates that in fact, there's a broad and deep knowledge, a quarter of all of the plants. And my notion is that it's probably an underestimate. Because frankly, by the time ethnobotanists began to look at the indigenous people of Illinois, they had been removed from Illinois and cast westward to Kansas and Oklahoma into Texas and, north of, and the northern part of Mexico. You can go online. This is the database the National uh, Ethnobotanical Database, just type it into Google, and you can bring up, I, I, I picked milkweed in particular because milkweed is a plant that's getting a lot of press uh, lately, and it literally will list one by one by one this digested data from ethnobotanical literature that gives uh, information about how different plants are being used. And so uh, Terry and I were interested when we were reading this this morning, uh, the milky juice is boiled until thick and chewed as chewing gum. I don't know about you, but the milky juice of milkweed pods is probably something I'd rather leave on my hands. But obviously, it, it has some satisfaction. And this is the kind of information that's available in these kinds of documents. So to reiterate, we have Oral traditions grown over generations, passed on. Ethnobotanists interacting with indigenous communities are uh, willing to share that information, which is drawn together and documented and synthesized and articulated now in digital means by which we can learn from that long heritage of the applicability of plants to particular means. Now we need to get into time. Time is an extraordinary commodity, especially if you can use it to some advantage. And we're gonna look at the interface now between archeology span and botany to look at plant use over time, because it will be no surprise to you that the use of plants over time has changed profoundly. And we're going to explore a little bit about how we end up doing that. Uh, so archaeobotany, no surprise here, combining a couple words, it's the, it's the exploration of ancient plant remains and trying to understand how people use them to sustain life. 
uh, not only as food, but as different kinds of materials. And as you'll see, the precision by which we can look at the record of antiquity and understand the relationship between uh, plants and people also has a kind of specificity that allows us to identify grand trends in human beings uh, and their relationship to the world around them. Uh, you might ask, uh, you know, if I rake leaves and put them in a pile and I come back in a year, they've composted and they're not there. So how is it that plant remains can even survive a year or two or season, let alone thousands of years? And the answer really has to do with a series of issues about plants, plant remains being buried. But the one key factor that archaeologists rely on in particular is that they're turned into charcoal. Native people use plants for a variety of things, not the least of which is fuel. Uh, in many instances, food materials came into contact with fire, and those elements are turned into charcoal. Charcoal tends to be relatively inert, and it persists for a very long period of time, and it has its own story to tell. In fact, let me, let me digress just, just one moment. As an undergraduate at Illinois State University, Professor Ed Jelks walked into a class, Native uh, Prehistoric Man in North America was the title of the class, uh, Sociology 283. And I can tell you on my first exam, I spelled the word site, S-I-G-H-T, when it was supposed to be S-I-T-E, and I'm forever embarrassed about that. <laughs> in that class, if Professor Jelks had said, what's the antiquity of Native people in North America? If you answered anything other than 10,000 years, you would be wrong. Within the last year, a discovery near White Sands, New Mexico. Do you know this discovery? White Sands, New Mexico. Uh, the discovery of beds of sediment that have uh, the remains of megafauna, of mastodons and mammoths, was found in, in a deposit. In between these two deposits was a layer of sand which had been silicified, had been hardened and there were human footprints in the sand. So the question was, how old are they? Well, it turns out a young man who was an intern at the Illinois State Museum, has a PhD in geochronology, works for the federal government, was brought in to recover remains from this place. He found seeds in the horizons above and below the footprints. He dated those seeds by radiometric assay, essentially documenting the amount of time that had passed since those plants had died. And he came up with the date of 22,000 years ago. So in my lifetime, our understanding of the past here is twice as old as I thought it was a mere 40 years ago. Plants are the means by which we can tell time as well. So this carbonization process turns out to be really important. What's the past look like? Here's an example. Uh, some years ago, uh, in the late two, 2000, 2007, eight, uh, archeologists at Dixon Mounds and Michigan State University gathered together. They were interested in a village that is perched at the crest of the bluff overlooking what's now the Emaquan uh, Nature Preserve. Uh, this community was occupied, we think, about 700 years ago, about 1300 AD, uh, and maybe at about 1,000 years ago uh, as well, about 1,000 AD. Uh, one of the things we know is people in these communities tend to be pretty fastidious. So when they gather together a bunch of material, they tend to dig holes in the ground and take that material and fill those holes in. So they're disposing of refuse from everyday life. In some cases, those big pits are used to store food. In other cases, they are used to uh, harbor uh, debris. And in other cases, they're used for food preparation. In this particular example, you'll notice some dark streaks. Those dark streaks are lenses of, cal of, of charcoal that have been accumulated. Archaeologists excavate these things very carefully. They collect samples of material. And believe it or not, we collect bushels and bushels of dirt. And it turns out that uh, 
uh, the, the notion that archaeologists are only interested in artifacts, spear points, and other pieces of pottery and so on, while true, is incomplete. And it turns out that the past is also stored in that sediment. Let me give you an example about how this works. So we go to a site and we excavate, and for every level of sediment that we excavate, imagine the floor, if you will, it's laid off in a nice grid. Each one of you is responsible for excavating one of those squares. Each level of the sediment that you excavate, you're gonna save some of it, put it into a container, and send it to a uh, town to be processed. And so from an excavation, we end up with half a bushels of dirt. And we take that in the old days, we would take that dirt down to the Illinois River, and we would use a wash tub, an old style wash tub, and we'd cut the bottom of it out. We would lay in a stainless steel mesh uh, of one millimeter size opening, so it's essentially window screen. And we would take the, the bucket, hold it in the water, and the sediment sample would be poured in, and you would stand there and agitate it. I, I remember the first day that Professor Strever from Northwestern University took a look at me and he said, you have these great long arms and I've got just the thing for you. <laughs> and so I spent a summer waist deep in the Illinois River with one of those buckets in front of me, churning the heck out of that thing. And it turns out that when you do that, there are lots of things that come out of it. When you look at that image, the uh, cylindrical barrel-shaped thing in the upper left is the vertebra of a fish. The white material of the tip there is the tip of a stone drill. The small pieces of black material in that image are bits of wood charcoal. What, what was discovered is, for years, archaeologists had taken sediment from the site, thrown it onto a table screen of half-inch mesh, allowed the dirt to filter through the half-inch mesh, collect everything off the top of the screen, and call it a day. And then someone looked at the fine material that went through it. In the late 1960s, a faculty member from Northwestern University said, you know what? There's small-scale remains in here, and we need to recover them. And he came up with this technique, this flotation technique. And so, once we began it, our notions about how people interacted with the world changed profoundly. Prior to this, if you'd said, what were people eating 2,000 years ago? Your answer would be deer and big fish. Thank you. Next question. When we started to look at flotation, what are people eating? You won't believe what it's the better question is, what aren't they eating? Because we could recover fish vertebra and get an idea from fish remains that, in fact, aquatic habitats are tremendously important to ancient people. That plant mint remains, which we would recover only in masses where we get a big wad of wood charcoal, we were missing all of the nutshell, all of the seeds, and small bits of, of plant material. So our understanding of plant use in the past was limited by the technology or the technological limitations that we brought to the, to the discipline. So flotation changed everything. And when you would take it, uh, uh, Stuart Schriever came up with another technique. If you put it into a liquid, which had a specific gravity that was just slightly higher than water, the plant remains in small snail shells would float to the top of that column. And the heavy material, pieces of stone and uh, bone, would descend to the bottom of it. You could use a scoop, scoop off the plant materials, dry that and send it off to the archaeobotany lab and say, tell us about the plants that are being used at this particular time. The bottom fraction, so-called heavy fraction, would be sent off to the zoology laboratory and they would pick through it and find small bones of animals, fish, etc., and be able to talk in a more comprehensive way about the notion of animal use. And then you make discoveries. Uh, let's see, the door prize tonight is can you identify those seeds? All of you are familiar with this plant. It is not maize. It's not Kentucky coffee bean. It is not sunflower. How much time do we have? Tonight? 
Lamb's quarters, Kena podium. And how do we know that? Because we compare these seeds, which are found as part of that fraction of plant material through flotation with modern examples. And we end up then being able to tally, much as an ethnobotanist would do, we can tally the variety of different species that are being used by people at different times in the past. There is the foundation for, if you will, archaeobotany, in which we can gather together this diverse assemblage of, of material and begin to then to make some sense out of it. What have we learned? It turns out, not surprising, is there is a very clear trajectory here, articulated in this sort of alliterative way. Our, our distant ancestors are collectors. Uh, they're not cultivators. Cultivation would come later, so we're, they're collecting plants. Next, they're collecting and uh, cultivating, so they become collector and cultivator. Next, we are not only collector and cultivator, but they begin to develop hybrids. And so you can see that over time, indigenous knowledge of plants expands from simply taking advantage of the kinds of plants that they recognize that are available seasonally to cultivating and growing plants and selecting particular varieties to expand and enhance upon. This is in fact, the foundation of human life today. And I would submit to you that if, if you look at us physically, we're, we're upright and bipedal, we've got opposable thumbs, we've got this peculiar structure in our throat that we can pass air through that allows us to form these sounds and then to articulate them in a particular way. Those are all magnificent developments. I might argue with you that either the next one, number four or number five, is going to be our relationship with plants. Its competition is tool making, but I would argue with you, as I hope to compel you in a moment, that plants have had a much greater impact on the world than simply tool making. This might surprise you. When you look at human history in its greatest expanse, for 99% of our existence, we have relied on hunting and gathering. That is to say, we take advantage, depending on what latitude we're at or where we are on the earth, that the availability of resources that are desirable to us can be accumulated either by hunting or gathering. In fact, I can tell you right now, I wished I'd reverse the words. This is the way I grew up. But in fact, we probably did a lot more gathering than hunting. And so this broad expanse, you can see as we move across this, you'll see the green stripe gardening. This is the beginnings of the cultivation of native species is 0.7 tenths of our existence. And when we put that little strip, you can't see it, can you? The little yellow line to the, the far end, we're talking about three tenths of 1% of our history as human beings has been spent farming, cultivating. So it should strike you a couple things. One is we have been very good at what we did for a very long time and we survived. And then as we explored the world in different ways, we began to develop new ways of doing things that turns, have turned out to be extraordinarily important to our well-being. Let's dig a little deeper. How is it that this works? This is a curve which you see in many different ways. I've tried to uh, simplify a little bit. Basically, the number on the uh, vertical axis is the number of people on Earth. And the lower axis you can see is time. And what I've done is to highlight a time period in human history when there is evidence, depending on where you are in the world, that human be beings begin to cultivate plants. So if your heritage is in the Middle East, you're starting this process six or 7,000 years before the time of Christ. If you're in North America among people living in the Illinois River Valley, it's about 4,000 years ago, or about 2,000 years before the time of Christ. 
And in different areas, it's delayed a little bit. It, as we will see, begins to have an impact. And in time, the accumulation of our ability to produce food in greater quantities is one of the engines that begins to uh, under, underpin population growth. And you can see when you couple medicine advances, food production, the capability of food production, industrialization, and you marry those things together. And I would argue the spark of all of this is food production. It has created one of the great challenges of humanity today is the fact that you can see in this 250 years ago, the population was less than a billion people on Earth. How many generations do you have to go? Not very many to get back to that time. So this change in our relationship with the world has had a profound impact. This will be on the exam. I'd start taking notes if I were you. I want to illustrate this to give you an idea about the impact here. The bottom axis is January through December. The green curve is plant productivity. In other words, what is telling you that the higher the curve, the more plant growth you have. So in, this, in January and February, not surprising, not much plant growth at a temperate latitude. As you go into the warm weather months, plant production increases. And as you come back into the fall and into the winter, plant productivity decreases again. The red line is how many calories we need as a group to survive. And you can see the challenges that people would have. If you can't provide those calories, what happens to group size? Does it get larger or less? It gets less. So one of the things you're trying to do is to offset this primary plant productivity, among other things, to gather energy and apply calories to another time of the year. And so what we begin to see relatively early on in societies around the world is the gathering of plant materials at the high productivity times of the year and storing that to, and aren't, aren't seeds and nuts the perfect vehicle for this? I mean, they're designed to be stored seasonally to germinate in the next year. And so we see early on, people begin to dig big holes in the communities that they live in, and they fill them with seeds and nuts and things to be brought out at different times during the year. Now I'm going to add the cultivation of plants. So we have the same curve on plant productivity, but when you can cultivate plants in greater density than the native distribution of plants, you can enhance the food production possibility at a particular place. And so in one square parcel of ground, now you can exceed the natural availability of food by increasing it with cultivated plants which gives you a greater amount of surplus and those calories can be redistributed to other times of the year. And if you were attentive, you'll notice that the red line is now elevated in terms of number of people that it can support. So this is a, a basic example of how all of this, this works. It's a relationship change between humanity and the, and the world around us. When we look at Native American history, in the Midwest, this is what we see when we study plants over time. The red represents no evidence of cultivation. The green represents evidences of cultivation. And you can see, I put some question marks there because one dare not be definitive in any scientific discipline because the first thing that will happen is one of your graduate students will write their dissertation about how you were wrong. You, you don't want that to happen. And so, what we know now from sites that we've excavated in Illinois is that there is absolutely compelling evidence that by 4,000 years ago, people are cultivating native species of plants. Things that are still on the landscape today have become part of the cultivated record of native people living in Illinois. Over time, not only does the diversity of plants increase. They begin to take a variety of different species, but we begin to see some species that aren't local, that they are species that are domesticated elsewhere, 
and become part of the gardening repertoire of people living in this area. The example, the, the, the far-flung, powerful example of this is maize. And as we'll see, the arrival of maize has a big impact on what happens. Uh, so this, just to give you a notion, on the right-hand side, first Americans, the first evidence of people. Uh, <laughs> old slide, 12,000, double it. So we, we divide this time in, in basic ways of life. So it's during the archaic period, a very long period of time that we don't divide up very well, that goes from uh, about 8,000 years ago to about 3,000, 4,000 years ago. This is a period when people begin to cultivate plants. What are they cultivating? In 1979, we were excavating a site where the Route 36 crosses the Illinois River, the so-called Eagle Bridge. And in a small basin, we found a mass of charcoal, processed it by flotation, sent it to the archaeobotany lab, and they came back and they said, there is a cornucopia of marsh elder seeds in that pit feature. But what we find particularly interesting is that the seed size of the carbonized marsh elder seeds in that pit feature are much larger than we find in native stands. So what are some of the evidences that people begin to cultivate? They become more selective. They pick plants, particular plants in a community that produce more or better or are more easily harvested. They're looking for qualities in particular plants to make sure that they get the seeds of those to make the next generation. And so the increase in seed size that we begin to see in kenopods, in things like marsh elder, is evidence to us that people have begun the process of hybridizing these plants and selectively uh, picking certain individuals to gather seed stock and use for next generation production. Sunflowers, another plant that is domesticated very early on. Our notion is it appears that some of the early dates are from the Eastern Plains in places like Kansas, uh, Western Iowa, Western Missouri, uh, and then they make their way into Eastern North America. Uh, there are many sites in Illinois that date to this time period that have uh, sunflower that appears to be domesticated. And we find it moving then farther to the east into Kentucky and Ohio sites as well. Little barley, a form of grass, shows up in a variety of, of sites. They have relatively tiny seeds, uh, seed heads that look uh, a little bit like wheat. Uh, these also are found carbonized within uh, these communities. The kenopod, uh, the, the specimen to your left is an uh, electron microscope image of it. People are uh, detecting evidences of domestication because the coat uh, of the seed itself is diminished as a result of cultivation, which means that it's more easily released from the seed itself, so the harvestability of it is improved. So there's clearly some selection going on here. And all of you uh, recognize kenopods, I'm, I'm sure. At Rec Not Weed, another one. Uh, how much money do we spend a day getting rid of these? And it turns out that these literally were the pillar of human subsistence during this remarkable time of transition beginning about 4,000 years ago, working its way through time that you begin to see increasing domestication of these, of these native species being brought to bear. Tobacco. If we had not done flotation with fine scale mesh, we never would have found these seeds, which tend to be extremely small. Now we know that at least 2,000 years ago, there's evidence of tobacco being found uh, domesticated within uh, North America, and maize. Uh, what a remarkable plant. In, in fact, it may be one of the only plants, I'm not sure about this, but I have a notion, there were two Nobel Prizes giving, given for understanding of the domestication of maize by two individuals who had different ideas. This tropical grass is found in sites in the west of Mexico, about 3,000 years ago. 
Uh, it begins to radiate from that location relatively quickly. We find old examples of maize in the American Southwest. And then slowly, it begins to appear in North America. In Illinois, if memory serves, the oldest dates are around 700 AD that we first begin to see maize, but it doesn't, it's not uh, used widely. There's not much of it. Now, when I, I used to like to ask fifth graders when they come to Dixon Mounds, uh, true or false, Native Americans were scientists. I'm glad to see that you passed fifth grade. <laughs> My notion is when you were in fifth grade, you might've said false. And in fact, many young ones do because they have this view of it, but imagine what it took to take a tropical plant and create hybrids of it that could grow in southern Canada. So there's a lot of investment in this particular plant of cultivating, of growing it, of keeping back seed, of getting different hybrids that make their way into society and are used eventually as one of the fundamental food sources for native groups. So maize plays a huge role in this. When we look over time, what I've done is giving you time from left to right, uh, about 4,000 years ago, over to about 1,000 years ago, where there are time periods uh, on the right-hand side. So we go from the early woodland period, which begins about 1,000 years uh, BC, and you can see that we've got evidence of little barley, of iva, marsh elders, or sumpweed, sunflower, and some of uh, one of the, the people varieties of squash. As we go forward, you can see that there are different species added to this. By the time we get to the late woodland period from about 800 AD to 1000 AD or so, we see our first evidence of maize. And then ultimately, by the time we get to what we call the Mississippian time period, the use of maize has expanded profoundly. Mind you that the complement of domesticated plants sort of sticks together in this. And we wonder now that some of these may be used as sort of specialty plants that are grown for particular applications, not necessarily for large scale dietary consumption, but maybe they're being used for medicinal purposes or other purposes. The suite of these specialty plants continues right on up into the present. What's the impact of cultivation? Three villages, each one of which archeologists have excavated a, a variety of different examples. Uh, the first one, a middle woodland village. Uh, the middle woodland time period about 2000 years ago. There are middle woodland villages up and down the major river systems in Illinois, the Mississippi River, the major river systems of Eastern North America. When we look at those communities, uh, for the first time, we have an opportunity to look at another use of plants. We find evidences of wigwams. Imagine this. We're excavating in the Illinois River floodplain. Uh, the sediment that is accumulated in this particular location is about two meters of dirt since 1840. So the river has been transporting topsoil from Illinois into the river drainage system and laying it out on the Illinois River floodplain. The 1840s pottery are found on that surface. We've dug down to that part of the surface. We've removed the, the historic plow zone, a, a zone of about uh, seven inches that would have been cultivated uh, with horse-drawn plow. And as we're scraping along, we find a, a small cluster of rocks. And they're peculiar, they're all clustered together, but there's a cylinder in the middle of it that's void, it's filled with sediment. We don't have any idea what it is. We continue to excavate. About a meter away, there's another one. And so we take photographs, we document it, we clear away some dirt. The next thing that happens is here's another and another, and they form an arc. And so we decide, okay, what's the circumference of this arc? And we say, if this is what we think it is, there'll be another one right there. We excavate it, and there it is. What are they? They're posts. They are rocks that were used to stabilize the upright posts of wigwam construction, where posts are taken, put into the ground, 
stabilized by using the rocks to, to strengthen their position in the sediment. The tops are bent over and tied and then covered with mats, bark, or some sort. So this house, we later dated, was 2,000 years old, the remains of a 2,000-year-old house. When we look at those communities and their size, the number of buildings in them, our estimate is that at a, a, a good time of the year, a big time of the year, when there's a lot of productivity, the late summer and fall, that the population of one of those communities may have been about 100 people. That would be a substantial community. As we go forward, a Mississippian town site, and there are many of these uh, up and down the Illinois River, uh, when we, we look at those communities, we estimate based on the fact that there are very clear house patterns in these big rectangular structures that are being built. There are stockaded walls around some of these communities that there may be 800 to 1,000 people living there. The city of Cahokia, which I suspect you know, located uh, at East St. Louis, uh, is a community that we have debated about its population for a long time. But I think that there, there is real security now in the possibility that there may have been 20,000 people living at Cahokia, and that from the town of Alton, the present day town of Alton, to the Thebes Gap to the south on the Mississippi River, some of my colleagues have estimated that 1,200 years AD, there may have been 30 or 40,000 people living there. How is it that you can support these populations? Plants. Plant foods. By themselves? No, there's lots else going on there. But the spark, the engine of this, is the fact that human beings and their relationship to plants had changed and evolved to the point that they have a, a more complicated, sophisticated way of life that draws on their understanding of plants as food. Now, you'll notice that this conversation has been mostly about food, and that's because we do find plants that fit into some of the medicinal qualities, of the medicinal types, but they're relatively rare. A seed here, a seed there. It may be that plants used for medicinal purposes are not exposed to the fire with the same kind of frequency that food plants are. And so, frankly, the record is biased, and our picture of it is, is not particularly clear. It's fuzzy. But it's difficult to believe when you go to the ethnobotanical literature, it's difficult to believe that ancient people didn't have the same kind of repertoire and that that repertoire born in the past has migrated its way to the present. When we try to take all of this together, what are the messages that I hope you leave with? First of all, three pieces of information, three sources of information that allow us to understand this relationship between humanity and plants, oral traditions, ethnobotany, and archaeobotany. Coupled together, you can see, create a core of knowledge that allows us to understand with increasing sophistication. And when you apply some of the technological means that allow you to look at the uh, genomic structure of, of plants as well, continue to expand our understanding about what these, how they work, what they provide, and so on. Second of all, there is a, a, re, a record that's replete with information in native communities of, based on oral traditions that provide us knowledge that extends into the distant past to the present about the relationship between indigenous people and plants. And then when coupled with ethnobotany, give us a remarkable approaching encyclopedic understanding of how the relationship with human beings and plants has been established and sustained over time. When you add the archaeobotanical research, we have less precision of focus, of sharpness. But what we have as our ally is this remarkable time perspective that we can look at variations through time and understand the circumstances under which this cultivation invention occurs over time, and then what it means to society. One small measure we just illustrated is the fact that communities are able to sustain larger groups of people over longer periods of time. And then ultimately, when we put all of this together, uh, 
there are a variety of applications which continue to be generated today. And there are, there are people still around the world today plumbing the depths of oral traditions in communities in the South American rainforest, for example, searching for plants that have different chemical properties or compositions that may have efficacy with respect to some application. So the search continues. The relationship between humanity and plants continues that was born all these great many years ago. So if you're curious on the topic, uh, look up ethnobotany and my notion is that you can spend hours and hours learning about plants that you can see as you walk down a path in Funk's Grove that have applications to today. And the archaeobotanical literature also is largely available to the public to explore as well. Those are the remarks that I had prepared for this evening. Thank you very, very much. May I say before I take your question, how delightful it is to see a variety of you whose paths have crossed mine so many years now. Uh, blessings on all of you. What a, what a treat this is. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a great question. In fact, um, and I regret I didn't put it into my presentation. So, <laughs> so what's happening is uh, when Smith is with the Menominee, for example, people in the community are taking him into the woods, and they're saying this plant is used for this particular purpose. They may have a different name for it and so on, but what he's doing is, is drawing correlations. He would say, that's willow. The ethnobotanist would say it's salix and, and so on. So they begin to couple together a recognition of, of a plant, how it is recognized within oral tradition communities, et cetera, and then how we articulate it today. So that's how the, the, the relationship is built. I think we are missing a lot. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think we see across the world is that there's a whole different way of looking at it and application. But it seems like there's been less of that. It seems like there's been less of that found in the Americas other than like some speculation about the Great Lakes copper and other things like that. So what's the differentiation? That sounded like a dissertation question. <laughs> it's a great question. It is the question that I think motivates us, any, anyone interested in how human society advances at different rates, at different places, in different means. And so, um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'll sound a little bit flip, and I don't mean to, but I want to I want to say it this way: Why invent metal if stone works? And and I don't mean to be sarcastic, but when you look at these big Mississippian communities, here's a road trip for you. Uh, many years ago, a, a gentleman who lived in Southern Illinois made a collection of large shirt digging tools, and he he must have gathered. 100 of them. Uh, his, he passed, his family brought them to uh, Fort Massac State Park and said, you want these? And the superintendent of the park said, absolutely. So the archaeologists for the Department of Natural Resources went and got them, drove to Dixon Bounds, called me up and said, I'm going to bring you something I think you'll be interested in. And he opened a box 
it was like every Christmas, the best Christmas ever. So here are these things. And when you begin to look at them, these are large digging spades. They are uh, probably hafted to a wooden handle. They are made of, of uh, very select examples of stone that come from a variety of resource areas in Southern Illinois. And some of my colleagues have argued that they're being mass produced in these communities uh, outside of Anna, Anna for example, uh, to the south and west of Carbondale. Uh, in a site there on a ridge, there are hundreds of pounds of debris from the production of these tools. And then they're being distributed throughout the Midwest. And they are being used, we, we believe, to cultivate the sediment to produce this, what must have been considerable acreages of, of um, maize bearing gardens. And so uh, that's not a very good answer. It's not a very complete answer, but it is, it is an answer that uh, the technology was adapted successfully enough to allow the first city in North America to grow up and be sustained for three centuries. So, the, the deeper root of your question about how it is we come to be inspired and invent is one of the great puzzles of the world, is it not? It, it is, uh, what is the famous example of the fellow who figured out the atomic or the uh, chemical structure of what is it, benzene or something like that? He saw it in a dream and he got up the next morning and drew it out and in fact, that's the way it was. So that's one of the magical parts of this. Metallurgy in North America Copper is, is one. We see a little bit of, of working with uh, hematite, which is an, an iron ore, but iron tools are really, is, if you will, forged out of the Middle East and, and Europe and are not known by native people until people arrive in North America that have them. So great question and well phrased. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, when I think about things like invasive species and then the population changes of a landscape, is there some sort of stockpile or sa saving of the seeds of plants that may not survive much longer, such as the uh, prairie that was just talked about up in Rockford? That's a great question, too. Uh, I'm not going to be able to give you a very definitive answer. But somebody help me out. Uh, my recollection is there are botanical storehouses in the world where large quantities of seeds of plants are stored uh, as an archive, if you will, with the idea that there may be some loss of... Uh, it's, a, it's a bank. It's a safety deposit box. But I, 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 can't, I can't tell you more. I, I wish I could. But... You, you can find the answer to that question uh, relatively easy, I suspect. Yeah. Bill Gates is. Yeah. Please, in the back, yes. Now that is a dissertation question. This is one of the great debates in, uh, did native people bear, burn prairies in the past? Uh, there've been two arguments about this, yes and no. And it, it has been, it has been a, a topic of great interest because uh, on the one hand, uh, the argument has been that there weren't enough native people in the, in the distant past, there weren't enough people. It's a terrible answer. I'd like a redo. Um, where, where did the prairie come from? If, you, if I took you to 8,000 years ago and we stood here in normal and we looked out at this landscape, it's trees. Trees for as far as you can see, roughly. Somewhere in that period, about 8,000 to 7,500 years ago, there is a significant uh, shift in climate uh, in the Midwest that uh, results in the expansion of prairie. And by Four, five, six thousand years ago, prairies are, are pretty well established. How do we know this? One of the great bodies of evidence of this comes from Chatsworth, Illinois, where in a bog outside of Chatsworth, a group of palynologists, what do they do? They study pollen, took steel tubes, jammed them in the ground, brought them out, sampled the sediment, uh, recovered the botanical materials in them, dated, 
them and found out that they had a record of plant materials that went back about 12,000 years. And then they looked at the species and they figured out, okay, here's when uh, there are ice age materials, uh, ice age flora on the landscape, giving way to the expansion of prairie, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, then the question became, how is it that prairies are sustained? Once you begin to get climatic episodes where there's more moisture, and, and so uh, trees have the tendency to, to be more aggressive, prairies need periodic burning, et cetera. And so the argument has been that native people got involved in this business and they would start maybe small fires to enhance uh, particular uh, distributions of plants that were desirable, like hazel, for example. Uh, hazelnuts, when you look at nut use over time, uh, walnuts and pecans early on, Big shift to hickory occurs for seven or 8,000 years. You get to 2,000 years ago, hazelnut begins to dominate. And one of the arguments is that the uh, habitats that hazels prefer are ones that are disturbed habitats and, and so on. So there's circumstantial evidence that people must have a hand in this somehow. And of course, the other argument is there aren't enough people that have really made much of a difference with respect to the prairie. Uh, and then, of course, the argument comes up, well, what about natural causes, lightning, and, and so on and so forth? Uh, I think the argument is, has been shifting year by year to people have a greater hand in this than not. But the detail of it is still evasive of understanding. It. So how can we figure this out? My notion is the way we figure this out is we find locations that are prairie edge places where sediment accumulates over time. And what you look for are veins of charcoal, because once prairie burns, it creates a mass of carbonized material, which then precipitation falls on, mobilizes some of that charcoal into streams and so on. And when they lay down deposits of sediment, they're going to be charcoal rich. So if, if we were to start today, you were asking me about your doctoral dissertation, you want to know the answer to this question, find stratified deposits that are in particular geographic locations and look to see what the intensity of charcoal is within those deposits. And my notion is you begin to get a sense about what's happening. So great question, still a puzzle, but it gives us a reason to get up tomorrow morning and try to figure it out. Yes, please. Do you know how long people, li how long people lived and why they died? Uh, we do. It's a sensitive subject. Uh, in archaeological history, uh, the well, who were, who arguably who were the first archaeologists in North America? True or false? It was the Pilgrims. False. Too bad. True. And I'm doing this in a very loose way. The Pilgrims land at Plymouth Rock. One of the things they're curious about is a mound of earth near their community, and they decide to excavate it. And when they do, they find the remains of an individual. And laid to rest with that individual, it turns out that there are objects which they are curious about. They leave the remains of the human being there, and they, they remove the objects. How do we know this? They write a letter back to relatives in England, and that letter is, is preserved, and you can read it. Archaeologists in North America became, not unlike archaeologists elsewhere, their attention became focused on mortuary sites. At first, not with any respect of understanding humanity, per se, but to recover objects that were laid to rest with the dead. And there is a tradition of excavation of burial mounds that begins in the early part of the 19th century in North America and proceeds relatively vigorously up to the 1950s. At that time, there is a fundamental shift in archeology, span which is how can we understand the past if we're studying the dead rather than where they lived? And you begin to see a big change. Now, what's noteworthy, in the 1930s, uh, an excavation crew from the University of Chicago is excavating in the Illinois River Valley, and they, have heard about the place known as Dixon Mounds. 
where the Dixons had exposed the remains of human beings, many, many human beings. Uh, among that group is a scholar named uh, Georg Neumann, and he is interested in uh, variations in the human skeleton. And he begins to look at human skeletal remains, Native American, indigenous people, human skeletal remains, with an eye towards stature, variations in morphology, uh, disease, and so on and so forth. And essentially, the, the modern discipline of bioanthropology is born out of some of those studies and becomes increasingly sophisticated over time. Uh, I would submit to you, if you turn on the television, you're hard pressed not to find a forensic program. And in large part, that forensic medicine has been tied to bioanthropology with the study of native remains um, um, representing a large proportion of, of that undertaking. Native people have not been happy about this for a very long time. There is a letter that was written to the governor of Illinois in 1930 about the bridge being built across the Illinois River at Star Rock, in which the Winnebago plead with him to stop the excavations by the University of Illinois on a burial mound at that location. Uh, their plea is not heard or responded to. Uh, obviously, over time, the, this voice has become more powerful, more assertive, and in the late 1980s, uh, the Congress of the United States decided it is time to address this question uh, seriously and Museums across the country and universities were required to document uh, human skeletal remains, which had been accumulated through scientific research or other means, sometimes farm folk digging them up. I mean, they, they came to us in a variety of ways. And today, uh, many tribes are asserting a, an opportunity to reclaim those remains and have them repatriated to those people. In 2012, if memory serves, the Peoria Indian tribe of Oklahoma came to the Illinois State Museum and said, these 130 people, the remains of these people are our people. And the remains were placed in cedar containers, taken to Miami, Oklahoma, and laid to rest in the community. This is occurring vigorously now across the United States. Now to answer your question. <laughs> Bioanthropologists have done extraordinary studies of ancient human remains and have learned a lot about everything from health and disease to longevity, uh, to how people dealt with uh, traumatic injury and so on and so forth. Not surprisingly, over time, life expectancy increased. And it probably has a, a lot to do with a variety of things, not the least of which is uh, the quality of food that's being consumed in some of these communities. So that by the time you get to a thousand years ago, uh, people are clearly living into their 50s. And uh, because we can't ascertain uh, predictable changes in human skeleton after 50 until relatively recently, there are probably people living into their 60s at that time. The problem has been, how do we tell time with your skeleton? You, you, you know already. When you're growing up, you lose a whole bunch of teeth, right? When you're younger, and then you get a bunch of wisdom teeth. The epiphyses on your long bones begin to fuse. The sutures in your cranium begin to fuse. So there are stage changes in the character of your skeleton over time. And bioanthropologists use those to try to. But after about 50, those changes are largely on a, on a different kind of trajectory. And it's only been recently in fact, one of my classmates in graduate school, George Milner, has been working with Danish archaeologists who have been given the opportunity to look at remains of Danish people that go back uh, substantially in time. And they, have, they, they know who the people are because they're historical records. They're looking at their skeletons. And what they are discovering is that there are some anatomical clues to be able to age human remains beyond 50 years. So there's new insight into the fact that uh, it's likely people 
Some people have very long lives in the past. The average is how are substantially less than ours. Though I note, if you paid attention to the news, our life expectancy rates in the last two years has done what? So we've got to do better. One more question, and then I think we... Uh, it's the uh, seed vault, the global seed vault is open. It's called the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. It's a secure backup facility for the world's crop diversity on the Norwegian island of Spitsbergen in the remote Arctic Archipelago. Ar anyway, it's up in the Arctic Ocean. Yeah. So there's a seed vault there, and they just opened about uh, 14 years ago. Bill, they're they're keeping seeds there. Thank you. Can you imagine how difficult it is to be a teacher today? <laughs> what did you say? I've got the answer right here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. And I want to tell you they were right. Wait till you meet him. And I can see and hear that you have really sparked an interest in so many Thank you so much for coming. We're, we're